I think you need to tailor the diet to suit you. So for example, if you're going to go full carnivore, then you probably look at the list of foods you can eat and then you probably start following those lists of foods and then it might not work for you. And then you might say, oh, carnivore doesn't work. But the problem is a lot with eczema, a lot of people with eczema have allergies to egg or they might have allergies to dairy. So you can't really adopt carnivore and say that meat is not healing for you if you're still being inflamed by foods in carnivore. If you're debilitatingly ill, I'd really recommend an intense elimination diet. For what, what I did was the reason why I went full meat-based is like I just didn't eat anything but meat for a few months. Mm -hmm. And that way I just eradicated everything else. Hey, how you doing, Bradley? Yeah, I'm doing well. Thank uh, you for having me. Absolutely, for sure. So uh, we're here today to discuss what you eat and how that's helped you. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Bradley? Yeah, so my story basically is I've had eczema my whole life. And so at the moment, just in terms of in terms of my work, like I'm a, at the moment, I'm a full-time musician. I'm studying. I've actually finished degrees in science, but that was majoring in mechanical engineering. And I have then studied music. So, cause I, my full-time work is in music. And now I've gone back to university to do graduate studies in science, but now focusing on biochemistry because I really want to be working in the field of like disseminating more of this health and information on the carnivore diet and how helpful it is to the community. So I really want to have some uh, credibility in terms of uh, knowledge. So I really want to, I, I want to, uh, I want to match my my story with the knowledge behind it. That's why I'm studying at university right now, biochemistry. So in terms of work, yeah, it's it's I'm doing music, but I plan to do biochemistry for work in the future to complement that. Um, in terms of marriage, no, I'm I'm single at the moment, and I'm just yeah studying and trying to yeah just trying to branch out as much as I can in this carnival world and spread the great information of how healing it is to as much people as I can. So in terms of my story, yeah, I've had eczema my whole life. So I was born. So I don't know if I was, my mom said I had definitely had eczema by three months. So mm -hmm. three months old. So anywhere between birth to three months, my eczema be quickly became debilitating. So I'm, wow. I'm not exactly sure why that is the case, but, um, you know, it, it may be factors like the immunization shots I took as a kid and I could have like an allergy to the adjuvants, the metals inside it, <clears throat> because today I'm very allergic still to silver and bronze. And uh, yeah, I had eczema my whole life, right up until two, a year, almost two years now, have I been healed completely. So yeah, wow. I've suffered for it. I've suffered from eczema my whole life and it's always been debilitating. I, it's always been oscillating between extremely bad to relatively okay. So there's some photos um, that exist on the internet of where I'm, I look, I look great. So people have been saying, well, you look great here. Why is it that you're saying that you had eczema your whole life? Well, of course, when you're uploading photos on social media, I'm not going to be focusing on how bad I look. I usually right. try to, I mean, most people do this. I mean, they, they take photos of themselves when they look really good. So <laughs> I oscillated obviously between really good and debilitating. So I was managing my eczema my whole life with steroid creams and antibiotics and moisturizers. So when it was good, because I was on these antibiotics and steroid creams to control the inflammation, I took photos and that's, that's why I look good on camera right. before. Yeah. But that's, anyway, that's totally understandable because, uh, you know, even somebody that's overweight, they're not going to want to take pictures, too many pictures of themselves while they're overweight. So yeah. and eczema is uh, it's an all over condition, right? It's not just, you know, not just your face. And yeah, it was hand, everywhere. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, I have memories of being in primary school and I'm playing with my friends and my friends were, you know, kind and compassionate enough that they 
didn't treat me any different. But when people who didn't know me would come up to us, they'd stop and look at me and say, what's wrong with your face? Or what's wrong with your skin? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd be really like, I wouldn't want to wear shorts because, and it was summer and it was really hot in here in Australia. And I, I just know that if I wore shorts, people would be able to see all the wounds, which are the size of avocado seeds, just covering all my legs. Wow. Really bright red. So yeah. And I just was trying to hide that. And people would say, yeah, why are you, why are you wearing pants? And the thing is, I'd go to school and the pants would just stick to your skin. So I'd come home and I'd have to rip off my pants. And by doing that, it would also rip my skin because it'd be weeping and bleeding and it'd be stuck to my skin and it'd just be horrible. So mm. I was, I'd be wearing these wet bandages over my legs to contain all the bleeding and, and I'd have to take off these gauze at the end of the day. And so life was like, really difficult in growing up like that but that's all i knew as a child so i didn't know anything better so i got used to it and i just assumed that this would be my life indefinitely and the doctor said there's no cure so i just took that as gospel and but having said that when i was 13 i started to realize that every time i ate things like mcdonald's i'd notice my skin starting to flare up so mm. I, I asked my doctor, like, is there any correlation between diet and eczema? And so the dermatologist I was seeing at the time said, no, I don't think so. I think that's just in, in your mind. And I said, wow. okay, what about, what about the chlorine pools? Every time I jump in the water, I feel like I'm inflamed by the chlorine. I says, well, it has a tendency to dry out your skin, but I don't think that's, again, that's not correlated. So straight away from 13 onwards, I was starting to feel like I was being gaslighted by doctors. And I started to question the official narrative. And at that age, I already started to avoid fast food, avoid chips and like the uh, like seed oils, although I didn't really think it was seed oils that were responsible. I just, I just avoided uh, really fatty, oily food, mm -hmm. because I noticed it really inflamed me. So, so fast forward, 2023, uh, the steroid cream stopped working for me. So I just, I've been using them my whole life. I was doing a bunch of therapies in Western medicine, like UV therapy, uh, everything under the sun that the doctors gave me. And so basically the steroid creams, at least they stopped working at multiple times. So I always had to increase the dose higher and higher until I reached a dose, which was really high. To the point where it stopped working and then the doctors were saying, look, it's no longer working for you. So I recommend you go on Dupixent, which is that biologic, which suppresses the uh, protein called interleukin. So it's not mm -hmm. an immunosuppressant, but it acts in a similar way, which it targets a single protein called interleukin and basically suppresses the eczema from being inflamed and manifesting on your skin. So mm -hmm. I was already, this was relatively new in Australia. It was only about five years old, but it's been older in the UK. So I was already highly phased and disillusioned by Western medicine at that point. And I really didn't want to take continuous injections every month, twice a month for the rest of my life. I just thought that wasn't addressing the root cause. It was just masking the problem. And at that point, I was really looking for a solution that was permanent like something that addresses the root cause and i mm -hmm. heard a lot about uh, i was experimenting with a lot of different natural remedies everything from cold water therapy to saunas and at one point i was testing i was trying to eliminate wi-fi radiation by turning off the wi-fi at night and i went so far as to research dr dr um, what's his name dr mccola and he was advocating Faraday cages because I noticed my skin got, skin got really bad in March 2020, which was the beginning of the pandemic. So in my mind, I was thinking this could be related to the pandemic. Maybe this is inflammation from COVID itself, or maybe it's also to do with, I was noticing all these 5G towers come up. So, and I researched the 5G towers and it says that increased radiation in the form of Wi-Fi, you can have EMF sensitivity. Not, It doesn't affect everyone, but it affects some people where they have migraines and they get dry skin and they're hypersensitive to EMF. So I, said, mm -hmm. I thought to myself, you know, 
yeah, a lot of people say, you know, that's not the Wi-Fi. What are you crazy? But right. um, but for me, I just I I thought maybe I was in that small minority of the population where I was I was really sensitive to EMF because that was the only difference is mm -hmm. COVID and the EMF and like at that point we didn't have huge lockdowns like people were saying maybe it's the lockdowns that affected you because you were inside all the time and you didn't get enough vitamin d and there was dust no it was actually before that that it started to happen so i tested the idea of a faraday cage i mean physics 101 i nice I basically, yeah so i just <laughs> insulated my bed with all of this aluminium oh sorry at the time it was silver sheeting i didn't realize i had a silver allergy at that point so i learned oh, wow. the hard way it worked of course because the emf frequencies didn't penetrate and and i wasn't getting any signal on my phone so i'd go inside that faraday cage and i had the most tranquil amazing sleeps and my dreams were vivid and even my dad uh test uh, testified that when he slept in that cage, yeah, he said, yeah, I feel like I'm sleeping in the country. I'm like my dreams are so vivid. Wow. So it was great. But the thing is I was highly allergic to silver, which I learned the hard way and my skin just broke out really badly. So yeah, I had to change. I redid the Faraday cage. I didn't want to like just stop it there. So I tried it again, but this time with aluminium. So aluminium worked really well, but I wasn't noticing any improvements with my skin. So mm -hmm. I ended up stopping it. So, you know, I could still try it today, but I just felt like it wasn't, it wasn't making it better. It wasn't making it worse. So I couldn't, I just didn't know what to do. So I just stopped doing that. And I started trying other things, you know, cold water therapy, sauna. So then I, I went to all of this, this really holistic gym where everyone there were like, I don't know, you describe them as awake or woke, if you will. And they, right. they, they all subscribed to healthy diets and they all did saunas and cold water therapy. And they all testified to the immense benefits of ice baths and how it reset your vagus nerve. And just the, the, the amazing transformations that you'd have losing weight by going into ice baths. So straight away, one of them there, who was the owner of the gym actually said to me, you know, I had eczema just as bad as you. I mean, you wouldn't believe it because you look at me now, I have no eczema at all. You know, you should just research the carnivore diet. That's what I'm on now. And he says, just eat. Like he actually advocated to go further than the carnivore diet, which I did. I did the lion diet. Mm -hmm. So this was, I started it in 2022. Uh, I know the day is June 22nd, 2022. I started. So he said to me, just start it today. Don't like do the research as you go, but just eat meat. You know, don't worry about, you know, because I was saying, what about like constipation? What about, you know, heart disease? If I'm just going to be eating meat nonstop, <laughs> is that a concern? Right. And he said, you know what? There's a lot of propaganda online and, you know, the same, you know, because I was already aware that, you know, Wi-Fi could, could potentially be a problem. Like I've, I've read the studies of how it increases risk of cancer with mobile phones and mm -hmm. and I was I was already questioning a lot of the narrative and even even during covid I was questioning the whole you know the vaccines and all that right. so I was I was open in my mind to these to the idea that the health the dietary recommendations were wrong I was open to that idea so he said just you know a lot of this is propaganda that we're led to believe meat is intensely beneficial it's the most bioavailable nutrient dense food on the planet and we've and humans have been surviving eating this diet for more than like for at least two million years of human evolution so if it caused cancer like we would we wouldn't be alive today to right. talk about its benefits i mean you just need to look mm -hmm. at the inuit tribes who thrive on all an all meat carnivore diet and you can see how healthy they are I mean, you look at nowadays, actually, they have processed foods coming in, so they can't benefit as they can't benefit as much. You, can, you actually see that the uh, the modern diseases of society, like osteoporosis and and uh, autoimmune diseases, are rising in their population now that processed foods are returning to them, uh, mm -hmm. are, are coming into them, and, and right. they're starting to consume it. But in the 1950s, if you look at studies done on them when they were still eating pure carnivore, pure carnivore diet ancestral diets you see that 
33% of America had osteoporosis and all of these autoimmune conditions and cancer, whereas only 1% of the Inuit tribe suffered from those same conditions. Mm -hmm. So they were just thriving. And then, of course, you have studies like in Hong Kong, they have the most, the highest meat consumption and they also have the longest lifespan. So mm -hmm. while I started this diet, I was reading The Carnival Code by Paul Saladino. And okay. I was just, I was just trying to assimilate as much information as possible. So once I finished that book, all my qualms of whether this is going to kill me or not was just eradicated. And I also you know, I watched uh, Sean Baker, Dr. Sean Baker, and and Dr. Ken Berry, and Dr. Paul Mason does in Australia does these amazing lectures on LDL and how, I mean, even Dr. Uh, Anthony Chafee, he talks about mm -hmm. just recently. He was talking about you know people who have heart attacks, have high levels of LDL or low levels of LDL. It's 50-50. So it's not like you have to have high LDL levels to have a heart attack. It's really 50-50. Right. And how can, you, how can you then jump and conclude that it's the LDL that's responsible? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I read books like Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, The Clot Thickens, amazing books. And basically it just says, you know, LDL isn't the problem. LDLs are like the fire trucks um at the at the like the fire trucks at the house that's on fire and everyone blames the fire truck because they're always there the fire the fire truck is the one is, is not responsible it just happens to be there when the fire is there right so the whole problem with the ldl as i as i soon learned was you know ldl naturally is is released by our liver i mean when we eat it's 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 um color micron which then forms ldl and then forms vl uh VLDL and then HDL, the good version, which which eventually returns to the liver and is reabsorbed when it's in a, in a healthy state, if there's mm. nothing wrong with you. So it's nothing wrong with the LDL is vilified, but it's not LDL's fault. It's sugar's fault, as Dr. Paul Mason talks about. Once sugar combines with LDL, it becomes glycated and mm -hmm. that form and then it for and then it it's damaged and then it can't be reabsorbed by the liver which then it then gets ab absorbed because it's just it can't be reabsorbed by the liver so it's just floating around your your veins or your arteries sorry and so at that point it gets consumed by the macrophages on the side of your veins which then forms atheromas which is then responsible for the blood clotting and the, the thinning of the artery walls which then result in atherosclerosis so all of this research i was doing you know obviously qualmed my qualmed my like uh, uh, relieved me in the sense that i knew that everything that i was being told about how deadly meat is and how it causes cancer and the world health organization iarc international agency for um cancer research is is saying how you eat if you eat meat every day, then your seven, your risk of cancer is increasing by seventeen percent, and if it's and if it's uh, processed meat, it's eighteen percent. So, yeah, all of this was just being eradicated and, and and proved to me that it was just propaganda. I mean, even even just to just to say further, even in the Carnival Code, there's a section of that book where Paul Saladino includes that there's independent researchers questioning the trustworthiness of of the IARC institution and trust and questioning the trustworthiness of the world world health organization saying please continue to eat meat this is not based on 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 solid research it's based on epidemiological studies one of which is the uh, there's this there's this um adventist group a vegetarian adventist group at Loma Linda University and basically they're they are inherently biased because they're vegetarian mm -hmm. and not just that the authors even note that the highest rates of cancer were conflated with those who were insulin resistant and obese so clearly he's saying the problem here most likely is the fact that you're insulin resistant and obese not the fact that it's meat and of course if you're eating meat all the time then uh, epidemiological studies are troublesome because how can you differentiate between the people who are living healthy lifestyles who are lean thin working out and eating meat versus those who are not caring about their lives and just smoking drinking and eating meat because they think it's bad for you anyway like you know they're doing all all three they don't they don't care so 
he said, you know, most epidemiological studies are very hard to trust, so just throw them out. And the, the horrible thing is, is the IARC reports are basing a majority of their studies are epidemiological. So yeah, there's no there's no reason to be afraid that meat's going to cause cancer. And, yeah. you know, even now, Sean Baker is doing amazing research with his, I mean, there's the Harvard study, I think that he, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if he found it. I, I think he founded it. So the Harvard study, which it's, again, it's observational, so it's hard to trust, but there's just so much. I mean, every single, 100% of people who had diabetes, who did a carnivore diet, came off injectable medications. And uh, I mean, it has amazing just results for autoimmune diseases, diabetes, and just comorbidities, like, every, like so many cases of people who have disease were resolved through a carnivore diet. And you're seeing it through anecdotes around the world, um, myself Absolutely. included. Absolutely. So anyway, a hundred days into my journey. What, was, was, what was your first meal? Once oh. you said, okay, this isn't a crack pot thing. I'm going to try it. What, what was your first meal? <laughs> I was just buying. <laughs> well, actually at the start, I... I had had a lot of chicken feet. I'm not sure why, because I was trying to get, actually I was trying to get more fat intake into my body because I knew that I needed to have a 70% fat uh, macro. So I was, I was trying to eat leaner cuts. I'm sorry. I was going to have fattier cuts of beef because I was, I made that mistake at the start. I was eating lean cuts of beef and people who were carnivores reaching out to me said, you know, this is too lean. You need to have, there is a thing called rabbit starvation. You need to have more fattier cuts. So at the start I was having, I was having, um, what do you call it? Oh, there's, there's a really lean cut here in Australia. I think it's called, oh, I forget what it's called, but it's, it's just a really lean cut, which doesn't have much fat on it at all. And the thing is it's cheap. So that's why I bought that because it filled right. me up, but quickly into it, I eliminated the chicken feet and I eliminated, I eliminated chicken and fish because Paul Teledino said, you know, fish is fed a lot of fish is fed. A, it has a lot of uh, mercury and it has a lot of heavy metals in it as well. Chicken is fed soy and grains. It's monogastric. So you have to cut that out. Same with uh, pork. Mm -hmm. it's, I believe they're monogastric. So yeah. they're also fed soy and grains. So avoid that. And I was already allergic to eggs. Every time I tried eggs, I was being inflamed. So and in fact, only recently I tried eggs again and I'm still kind of recovering. I mean, I'm, I'm healed, but you can see there's some red, a red dot there. That's right. from the egg. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I tried that a few weeks ago. So that's, it takes a while to heal. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I avoid eggs. But basically what I started off with, the things that worked well for me were the fatty cuts of meat, like T-bone, T-bones, um, Ribeye steaks, uh, yeah, ribeye steaks, T bones, Scotch fillet. <laughs> they're, they're really expensive cuts. So yeah, my my, and I was getting grass fed too because I didn't I didn't want to, I didn't want to blur the results by eating grains and then being not and then then being uncertain whether the grains are triggering it or not. I really wanted to go extreme and and cut out any inflammatories whatsoever so mm -hmm. i really wanted to eradicate the grains in case it inflamed me so i was doing grass-fed and i still do grass-fed to this day so yeah it was much more expensive but yeah i was going for the the high-end t-bones ribeyes so yeah 100 days into my journey and at that point like i mean i noticed i noticed it was improving within two weeks two weeks i was already i could sleep I could, I could sleep longer than an hour because you must realize in this three years from tw 2000, 2020 to 2023, like was uh, 2022 around October was when I started to heal. So it's roughly a three year period between uh, like 2020, 2021, 2022, Ruff, roughly three years. I went through this period of just debilitating, excruciating pain and this hell on earth of eczema everywhere where I couldn't work anymore. It got so bad that, you know, I was teaching and my students would be looking at my fingers and like I, I knew customers would come in and I would be teaching them piano and they wouldn't come back because they just, I mean, my, my hand was horrific. So I just stopped teaching. I quit my job and I just couldn't do much at all. And I remember even 
some of the parents who were loyal to me because they knew me before it broke out so horribly because mm -hmm. I had it my whole life, but it was really debilitating from 2020 to 2022 when the steroids stopped working and they could no longer mask the pain anymore, the mask, mm -hmm. the expression of the eczema. So they were, parents were telling me, why don't you wear gloves? And so, I mean, hmm. I, just, I just said to them, look, I, I know it looks horrible, but I'm comfortable with the way I look. I've, you know, I've, it's, it's horrible and it's unsightly, but I'm, I'm not going to run away from how I look. And when I wear gloves, I can't play the piano very well. And not only that, it just exacerbates my eczema because my skin sticks to the gloves and then I have to rip off the gloves yeah. and then it just yeah. causes more bleeding. So I'm not going to wear gloves, even mm -hmm. though I know it's unsightly. So, you know, if you don't like the way it looks, you know, I'm not going to be offended if you don't hire me. So, mm -hmm. but basically I quit most of my work because I couldn't do much at all. So I was just lying in bed and most of the time mm -hmm. was really awful. And so most of the time I couldn't sleep because it's just so itchy. I'd be lying in bed and I'd, if I was lucky enough to sleep for an hour, I'd be dreaming or, and in my dreams that have like, I'd be dreaming that I was crawling over glass <laughs> or oh, I'd be, yeah. Or I'd be dreaming that there were electrical wires hanging from the ceiling and I was electrocuting myself by walking through them. Or I'd be dreaming that there was crabs everywhere and they were pinching me. So, wow. yeah. So even the pain was manifesting in my dreams. So yeah, it was horrible. So within two weeks of this diet, I was noticing I could sleep again. I could sleep much better than I used to. So it just, it just was getting exponentially better with time. And by a hundred days, I no longer had eczema on my body. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. And I actually returned to the doctors afterward and I said, look, I healed myself. And uh, the doctor said, oh yeah, that's amazing. How'd you do that? And I just said this book. So I, I held Carnival Code by Paul Saladino. And he said, yeah, Bradley, you really need to, you, you need to be highly questioning of materials such as that because it's not really you know he's, he's he says he's a doctor but it's not really based on consensus and and universal science so i mean, I mean like but he healed me yeah he's, what yeah, about the yeah. consensus of one yeah yeah he yeah. said you know yeah but it, it may heal you but you know you still got you know your skin's still a bit dry there so you could still benefit from Dupixent. So I was just like, oh, this is ridiculous. This is the best I've been in my entire life. I've never looked healthier than this. Okay. And so I, I've just, I just haven't gone back to doctors since, uh, apart from maybe a few blood tests, which I've, which I've done. And of course, right. the blood tests show that my LDL levels are very high. And, and the doctor was concerned saying, you know, your, your blood your LDL is higher than normal. I, you what are you what are you eating or what are you doing so but of course I'm, I'm not concerned about that because i've looked at dr paul mason's lectures and he says as long as your ratio of triglycerides to hdl i believe is smaller than one then you should be fine and my ratio was 0.33 so yeah it's all fine that's awesome yeah uh, I'm, I'm i'm with you there with the ldl i mean I started for a different reason, a, a, an autoimmune condition called vitiligo, which also ah, affects the skin. Yeah. And uh, that's reversing, which oh, they say there's no cure for that. Um, so that's incredible. But it healed like 20 other things, mm. uh, it, you know, in the meantime. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I, I don't need validation at all with LDL, if it, whether it's good or bad or not intuitively i know because of eating this way all of these things are fixed and i feel awesome like i'm 47 but i literally feel like i'm 20. yeah uh, it's incredible <laughs> so that's, that's all the validation that i need that's all the consensus that i need is the consensus yeah. of one the one that's been through it and uh yeah if i have a heart attack down down the road for whatever reason so be it i lived a great yeah. life until that point so <laughs> Yeah, I'm the same. You know, if I was going to return to a standard diet, the amount of pain that I'd be suffering through, I, I, I mean, I don't believe I'll have a heart attack. I really don't believe that. You know, a lot of people on, on, on Instagram are telling me, you know, make sure some of the comments from vegans or whoever who are skeptical, they say, make sure you have a doctor close by because, yeah, your skin looks good, but your insides probably are rotting and, and you're probably just going to have a heart attack one day. So, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> if I was going to return to a standard diet, like the pain and suffering that I'd go through is just horrible. So I'd rather, I'd rather the life I'm living now with the uncertainty that I'm going to have a heart attack in, in 10 years, which I really highly doubt that's going to happen. Right. But I mean, that the pleasure I have of being able to live liberated in my health and able to do whatever I want um, is, is a much better pathway than the alternative where I'm being safe and adopting a standard diet where I'm just in debilitating pain and literally dying. I was literally dying at that point. I was hospitalized usually every six months because it's, it's, it was a continuous cycle for me. Like there's these mm. phases of being healthy and they're relatively healthy where it's not really healthy. It's just controlled by steroids and antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And then it would get worse again. And, it, and and once it gets worse, I'd have to return back to the antibiotics and the steroids. And usually I'd be hospitalized. And yeah, it's just a continuous cycle that gets worse and worse and worse. Every time I use antibiotics, two weeks later, it comes back even worse once I'm off the drugs. So, mm -hmm. you know, when during that three-year period, I was trying to i was trying to not like i was trying to not use the antibiotics as long as i could as long as i could like try to try to just not go to the hospital and and because i knew it was the same cycle i didn't want to repeat the same thing so i was trying to like hold it off let's see how long i can last just trying these natural therapies and yeah it got to a point it, at one point it got so bad that I was just, yeah, this is horrible. I need to go and go into the hospital. And then the doctor was like, yeah, lucky you came in because if you hadn't like your blood is you've, it's like, you've got sepsis and it's just, it's just, wow. uh, yeah, you need to you need to go on antibiotics and oral steroids immediately. And of course, when I did that, it cleared, cleared it all up, but it's the same thing. And so I said, this is, this is no way out. This is just, it's just going to, it's going to be like this forever and it's just going to get worse and worse. And yeah, I was literally dying in that pathway. So with the path, the path I'm on now is you could be potentially dying in the future, and but I'm healthy the whole time in the meantime, and I can do whatever I want. I mean, yeah, you gotta, you gotta consider before I was, I literally did a six month course in uh, software, uh, software engineering, like computer programming, because I just didn't want to see people. Mm -hmm. It was that bad. I wanted to just work from home and code behind my computer. But now I'm, I'm, I've reached a stage where all anything I could, I could do anything again. So uh, it's open right. pathways where I can return back to university and, and do biochemistry. And I don't feel inhibited by, you know, the stress of being constantly itchy every day and just in debilitating pain. So yeah, it's, it's really, it's the freedom of health and liberation. That's amazing, Bradley. That's that's yeah. absolutely incredible, and I can't imagine what what that must feel like after decades of uh, yeah. that condition. Yeah, it was a dream, honestly. To as a kid, you know, like I thought it was just a, a dream. You know, you know, you know, kids wish to you know for, to you know they they wish for riches or they wish for this or to 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 be a Jedi or whatever they want. But like <laughs> my, my dream as a kid was, you know, I wish I could. I saw my friends diving into the pool or, you know, taking their shirt off and then they had pure skin that was unblemished, mm -hmm. you know, glowing in the sun. And I'd look at that and I'd say, wow, I, I wish I had, I wish I had that. And like my, my favorite, like superhero as a kid was Wolverine because he could, you know, I, I said to myself, if Wolverine had eczema, <laughs> he could just scratch and it would heal in, in two <laughs> seconds. Right. So, yeah. yeah um come on be truthful. A, he's, he's still your favorite right yeah he's still my favorite <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean you know like i i dream to have pure skin and so to, if i if i was to tell myself you know one day you will because i asked that to the doctors you know is there a chance that i could outgrow this and she said, yeah there is a chance the doctors would tell me yeah there is a chance but i mean the fact like it was a possibility. So I always had hope, but getting older and older and it was not going away. It was actually getting worse. The doctor said, look, I just don't think it's going to go away. The only way to manage this is with steroids indefinitely mm. or dupixent for the rest of your life. And, uh, but yeah, if I would have told myself as a kid that you'd be living like you are now, like I just, it's just a dream come true. Wow. So, so prior to, uh, you know, this, uh, miraculous healing that you've had, Mm -hmm. uh did you struggle with any kind of depression or anything like that 
Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, so every, every single day, I mean, the, the standard, the standard statistic of people who suffer from eczema is 36% more likely to contemplate suicide ideation and 44% more likely to kill themselves. So wow. this is, yeah, it's just awful as it is. And I remember reading these, I used to listen to podcasts all the time because I couldn't sleep. So I just have the, the voices from the podcast on my phone going beside my bed mm-hmm. because it'd be cathartic and, and hearing other people's stories. And yeah, there's this girl, uh, she was, her name's, I think the eczema conquerors, the eczema warriors, I think it's eczema conquerors. And she basically was just journaling her stories and getting people in to talk to. And she was talking about how, when she was living in Hong Kong, like she was living on this 11th story building and every night she'd be thinking about, you know, jumping out the window. It was just so, so, so so sad. Yeah. And, uh, she, I, I forget the exact stati- statistic, but they were talking about there's this, there's this, uh, this spectrum like it's from zero to one where they measure your quality of life, and people who, like if you're one, you're you're absolutely healthy and you're happy, mm-hmm. and zero is debilitating. So people who had cancer measured like zero point three, and the doctors were astounded because people who had debilitating eczema also measured zero point three. And hmm. the doctors were saying, yeah, why are they, why is the quality of their life so poor? Like they don't, they're not dying. It's just rashes on the skin. But uh, yeah, if you, if, if people have eczema, they can, they will know completely why that is the case because it's just so debilitating and you're in such pain every day and you just, you can't escape your own body and you're just, yeah, you can't sleep and it just taxes your mind. Like, how can you, like, how can, like, I remember doing exams where I was doing this like accounting exam and I was just like, just as a breadth subject to my science degree. And I was just shaking in the exam because I was that itchy. And I was, it's, it's hard to think and concentrate when you're in that much pain. It's debil- debilitating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was in terms of depression and, 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 you know, suicide ideation, I was, I was never suicidal because I was, I always had, I always had this hope that I, I said to myself, I'm going to find a way through this. I don't know how, but I'm going to find my way through it. And it was almost like a delusional hope. Like, I know I'm not going to be like this forever. I'm going to find a way. I don't know how, but I will. I'm not going to live like this forever. So that's why I, I journeyed through all this alternate therapies i i was just disillusioned by western medicine i was looking constantly for things i was looking for hope everywhere i could and that what that's what kept me buoyant in my mind and and stopped me from sinking in, into depression so but of course it got very hard because i mean i had I, I was living at home with my parents and my parents were helping me like mm-hmm. my mom even tells me how you know she she suffered also because she she couldn't sleep because she knew I was, she could hear me upstairs, like, like moaning and she could hear me like in pain. So she'd, she'd usually come upstairs and she'd try to bandage like what she'd, you know, sometimes she'd, she'd just scratch my hair because she knew that relieved me. At least that would, um, that would uh, distract me from the pain in my body and that would help me fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So she, she, she would, she would bandage my wounds so she'd spend a lot of time just sitting up with me at night and helping me. And she'd go to, to work the next day and she'd be falling asleep at her job at the desk because she'd spend like all night with me trying to put me to sleep. Wow. So, yeah, but I remember like thinking to myself and telling my parents like, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm young now, but what happens when, you know, 30 years down the track once you're like or 40 years down the track once you're both passed away and i'm living by myself like i don't know how i'm supposed to care for myself if it's getting worse every year and i'll just be living in debilitating pain like what quality of life do i have Mm -hmm. it'll just be it'll just be awful and i can't imagine a life like that so i mean i i used i remember thinking to myself the quality of life is so awful is this life worth living like that would go through my head but at the same time, I'd, I'd never 
want to entertain those thoughts very long. And in fact, I was, I was in it in a point where it was just awful and I was really upset and, and, and just resentful of my state. But it got to a point where there was like a turning point in my mindset because I had this debilitating car accident where I almost lost my life and my dad was driving. Yeah. So like it's, it's a, a amazing like story in itself because, but like following that car accident, it changed my mindset and it made me realize because I almost lost my life in that car accident. Like just to go into it, like a car hit me at 80 kilometers per hour and my dad was driving and the car was spinning. So my dad was instantly unconscious. I looked mm. over at him and his eyes were rolled up in, in his sockets and I just thought he was dead. And, you know, the phone was hovering in the air and it was surreal where time seemed to slow because the adrenaline was surging through my veins. And mm. it felt like the force of God. It was just like, there was so much pressure. I, like I could feel the pressure in my skull and on my body. And I just felt like something was pushed. Like it was just this huge force. And eventually like, I was awake the whole time. I could hear my voice like from another dimension saying like, Oh my God, it's like screaming. And my dad was on the, on the wheel. So it didn't just stop there. Like his, he was driving. So he's, so his foot was still on the accelerator and we started driving oh. down the road really fast and off the, off the road onto the, onto the grass. And we were driving up the grass up a hill and I was just missing trees and missing poles. And I was, <laughs> Yeah, I was saying to my dad, I, 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 I was, I was saying, Cliff, I need to do something because my dad's like, he's unconscious, he's dead. I thought he was dead, but he was unconscious, mm -hmm. and I need to do something because if I don't stop this car, I'm gonna die as well. So I had a flashback to when I was eight years old. My dad told me, you know, if I have a heart attack when I'm driving, what are you gonna do? I, I said, I don't know. He said, Well, you need to pull the handbrake up and you need to put it in neutral. So when I was in the car, wow. that, I just flashed back to that. And I, I saw that in my head, like clear as day. I was like, okay, that's what I need to do. So I put the handbrake up and I put it in neutral and the car slowed. And like, so it did hit a second car. Like there was a, like we went across this whole hill on the other side of the hill was this, this car park and there was all these cars parked. So we crashed into the, to a car that was parked there and, uh, yeah, the, the car beside us actually had all these poles sticking out. So it was really lucky that we hit a pole that we hit, we hit the car next to it. That was just a standard car. There was no poles protruding. Otherwise it would have went right through the windshield. Mm. So, so yeah, it stopped the car, but it still hit impacted and all the airbags went off, but it was not fast enough to be lethal. So yeah. I, and the crazy thing is out of all of that, I remember like sitting in my seat and then thinking to myself, okay, now the car stopped. The engine was still revving because my dad's foot was still on the accelerator, but it was in neutral. And, you know, it was just going crazy. And I was like, I'm sitting here. Now is the point where, like, I've already, I'm already in debilitating pain from my eczema. Now is in the next few seconds, I'll, 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 I'll find out whether I'm, I'm a paraplegic or not. You know, in the next few seconds, I'll, I'll find out if I can walk or not for the rest of my life. So mm -hmm. I opened the door and I said, this is, this is the time. So I, I stepped up and I said, okay, I can walk. So that means I'm okay. And, you know, there's a bit of pain here, but it's probably fine. So it turned out I, the, I didn't have a single scratch on my body beyond the scratches I had from my eczema already. I was completely unharmed. And uh, like, you know, my friends and my family were saying that's, that's miraculous. You know, the, re the religious ones in my family were saying that's God protecting you. That's the mm -hmm. angels. And yeah, I, I went over to my dad on his side and I, I thought he was dead. So I opened the door and I was shaking him. And for about a minute, like he was just completely lifeless. And I was just doing it. Uh, like I, I just, in my mind, I was thinking, yeah, he's dead. There's no way he survived because there was blood coming from his forehead and the window shield was cracked from where he hit the window shield. I said, he's, he's just dead. So I was just shaking him and I was screaming like in a movie, like, wake up, wake up. And then a minute into that, you could hear the breath of life coming from him. And I said, oh my God, he's alive. So yeah, it was just crazy. And uh, there was a whole pool of people just like 
around the car saying, turn off the, turn off the engine, turn off the engine. So I turned it off and I said, call the police. And it was crazy. And then there was a whole period of time where he was, he forgot who I was. And I was just like, yeah. oh, oh, wow. Maybe he, uh, so he knew who I was, but he forgot my name or he forgot my age and he forgot certain aspects. He didn't know where he was and he was just disorientated and had memory loss. So mm. for, for a while I was thinking, okay, it, maybe he survived. Maybe he'll have brain damage from this. So I was really concerned for a long time, but he was fine. All he had was a broken sternum from the seatbelt working. Ouch. So, yeah. So his sternum completely broke in half, but obviously the seatbelt saved his life. So mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I was completely unscathed from the accident. So following that, I was, you know, I wasn't depressed, but I was resentful and I was very upset and I didn't know where I was headed and life was awful. But after that, I, I started to wake up in the morning, grateful for life, even though I was in debilitating pain and, and in my state, like close to death. Like, as I said, going to the hospital with sepsis, I was dying at one point. So I was still like in horrible pain and in just, just so infected, but I was still grateful. Like I remember waking up after that accident and just every morning I'd be looking at the sun rising and I said, I can still see the sunrise. I'm still alive. And even though, even though to just to look at the sun because the, the windows are to my right, just to turn my head, it, I'm in horrible pain just to look. I'm grateful to be able to see the sun rising. I love that. Yeah. So following that, like I remember talking to, I mean, I had, I had a podcast just recently with uh, this guy who, whose amazing story also. And he basically said gratitude is amazing in terms of healing because once you, once you find gratitude, it just, just the psychological aspects of healing. Like you, it's like, this is, I mean, this is, you know, it's just like how stress correlates to overall, you know, like you, if you're living in a stressful state, you can have more disease. You can be mm -hmm. more prone to disease. If you can find a place of gratitude, then, uh, you know, he, he was saying that's possibly why it accelerated your healing because you were living and you were grateful, even though you were still in a horrible state. So, yeah at that that was the pivoting moment like the, the that was 2021 that was like right at the center of of my three years of hell mm -hmm. and follow and following that a car accident being grateful it wasn't long after where i found like 2021 that was april so a year later i found the carnival diet and and i healed so i was already in a state where i was willing to accept if this is my life for the rest of my life where I'm in horrible pain, then so be it. But I'm still grateful for this life. So, that's yeah, awesome. that's, that, so that was my journey through, through, you know, depression and, and, and hardship. I tried really, really hard to remain buoyant in my mind by the whole time by reading like stories. Uh, yeah. So that, that was major, the huge pivoting moment. But on top of that, like I was reading stories of, of other people to keep me motivated to, like keep keep living and keep fighting i was reading stories of people who climbed mount everest and, and got lost like into thin air uh um what's his name i forget his name but uh in, in into thin air amazing account of they get lost on mount everest and through the sh sheer willpower to live there's this guy who's just lying on the side of mount everest dying of frostbite can barely move and you can see his family in his eyes in his mind's eye he can see his son and he can see his wife and he's and they're telling him to get up get up get up so he's just lying there on the snow and he just he said okay i'm gonna get up and, and he picks himself up and and he finds he, like a zombie he finds he manages to walk all the way back to base camp even though he can barely move and so i was reading these stories to keep myself sane and stories like Edward Shackleton, how he spent two years journeying the Arctic and finding his way back to civilization. So like I use these stories to, to keep myself buoyant because I, I just couldn't allow myself to sink into, into darkness. I just wanted to, I had to fight my body, not just, not had to fight my disease, my, my eczema, not just through body, but through mind. Yeah, that's that's incredible that you were able to keep your, yourself afloat. You know, some other people probably would have went to 
much darker places, you know, in your position. Yeah. So that's, that's really good that you were able to maintain that level of mental, uh, alertness, acuity, uh, you know, not going to that dark place. So yeah. what, what, uh, what's the depression like now that you're animal based? Oh, I, I don't have depression at all. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's just, I've just, I, I, wanted, I was life and so happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, even then, like, I, I don't, I wouldn't even consider, I don't, I don't like, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't consider it depression. I, I wouldn't label it depression. I would just label it, you know, intense sadness, which is, which is obviously a result of the horrible state that I was in. I mean, I know there's people who suffer from clinical depression and the, I mean, I'm not averse to using the term, but I just, I, I, I think I don't like to, because in, in my mental state, I wanted to, I didn't want to label myself as mentally ill. I, I wanted to, you know, if I'm sad, it's obviously because of the state I'm in. So I'm not going to like succumb. Yes, you're just depressed. I mean, I have been through stages where I have felt incredibly depressed mm -hmm. and, and I felt numb and I felt awful, but I, I wanted, I, I never wanted to say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm depressed. I suffer from depression because I felt like that was giving into the, into the label. So, mm -hmm. you know, you could, you, you know, it, pro it probably was depression, but I always fought that label. And I, I, if I was sad, it's, I was said it's induced from the state I'm in. I need to keep myself buoyant. I need to keep myself hungry for health by reading these novels. And so I always fought it and I always stayed buoyant, even though I felt like I was sinking every time into darkness, I'd always try to swim back to the surface as much as I could. Cause I said, my mind is everything. That's, that must be the fighter in you. You know, you're probably the yeah. only person that I know of that actually built a Faraday cage to, uh, <laughs> oh yeah my dad and i my dad was mainly the one who built it but i because he's great with his hands he, he built a lot builds a lot of things out around um his house which i live in and uh but uh yeah he built it and it was just great to i i obviously encouraged him can you please build a faraday cage because i think this will work for me yeah, yeah i love that man that's awesome so in your eczema is healed completely mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. your depression is not there anymore. Yes. Uh, is, is there any other, uh, side effects, if you will, of eating animal based that you've noticed? Well, of course, animal based, if I'm, you know, people, one thing I noticed is when I'm in rehearsals with my friends or studying, people say, uh, do you want a break? And so I, 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 I remember like I, I think to myself, oh yeah, that's right. We've been going for like two to three hours now without a break. And, uh, you know, you can just last a lot longer when you're on an all meat or all meat plus fruit diet, mm -hmm. because you just don't have the peaks and the troughs that other people have. Like if you're eating a lot of sugar or you're eating a lot of processed foods, you get, you know, the peak and then you just you feel fatigued afterwards. So on an animal based diet, it's just consistent. Like you don't need coffee to wake you up. It's just consistent throughout the whole day and you have a greater sense of mental acuity. And Jordan Peterson talks about this too. Like he just feels mm -hmm. like he can think so much more clearer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I also absolutely. practice fasting as well. So I, I don't eat until around 2 PM. So in the morning, just fasting, I, I have such yeah I, I, there's such mental acuity when i'm fasting i just feel so clear in my mind so the combination of animal based plus fasting is such a great duo because when you're eating heavy meals like meat you don't feel as hungry so, uh, so you mm -hmm. can you can stay fuller for longer so it really complements fasting plus animal based yeah yeah absolutely i love that yeah i feel this exactly the same way i mean my mental acuity is, ooh, it's off the charts. Uh, I, I actually had a car accident back in 2017 and suffered uh, brain damage from that. Oh, no. Yeah, they said, the doctor said that I lost approximately 10% of my brain function. Wow. Um, and that uh, effectively, you know, it may get a little better, but it's, it's permanent. That's crazy. And, uh, long story short, I went carnivore and within five months, I feel like I'm at 150% brain capacity now. 
Yeah. It, you know, that it's, it's gone far beyond that hundred percent. And I had uh, noticeable motor function uh, issues. Uh, I had motor ticks, um, balance, lots of balance issues. Uh, you know, I closed my eyes, I would fall over. Uh, yeah, I'd have to have a light on at night. I couldn't close my eyes in bed or I would have uh, vertigo symptoms. So wow. uh, live with that stuff for almost six years and then went carnivore and it's gone. I can't even Amazing. <laughs> What's it like when you lose 10% of your brain? Is it, do you have like, did it affect anything else? Like your sentience? Could you, could you feel like limiting uh, like, did it limit your sentience in any way? Uh, like memories or yeah, it, how you well, perceive definitely. the world? Yeah, there was long-term and short-term uh, memory loss. Wow. And and also cognition. So I couldn't concentrate on, you know, I was a controls engineer at the time, and I couldn't concentrate and use my brain for more than 30 minutes to an hour. And that was it. Wow. I was done for the day. Um, wow. so the doctor put me on limited work, uh, for, for weeks and weeks, I couldn't go to work at all. And then I gradually introduced, you know, I was at work for two hours then I was at work for four hours and then six and then finally eight. But still, uh, I still would get, even if I went to work for eight hours and then went home and did some stuff for a little while, the, my brain would get, eventually get overloaded and, uh, I would start the motor ticks would start showing up at that point once once I would get overloaded and nothing would fix it but rest. So but that yeah. completely went away after I ate carnivore for about five months, which is Amazing. insane. <laughs> yeah, insane. Yeah. Yeah. So what health advice or I shouldn't say health advice, but what what tips would you uh, have for somebody? that is considering uh, a diet change or they're looking for answers that has uh, eczema, what, what would you suggest for them? Yeah, I think uh, it's, I think every single person is different. So it's very easy to say, just adopt a carnivore diet. And I don't like being ideological in any sense, whether carnivore or vegan, Mm -hmm. I think you need to tailor the diet to suit you. So for example, if you're going to go full carnivore, then you probably look at the list of foods you can eat and then you probably start following those lists of foods and then it might not work for you. And then you might say, oh, carnivore doesn't work. But the problem is a lot with eczema, a lot of people with eczema have allergies to egg or they might have allergies to dairy. So you can't really adopt carnivore and say that meat is not, healing for you if you're still being inflamed by foods in carnival so i mean if you're debilitatingly ill i'd really recommend an intense elimination diet like for what, what i did was the reason why i went full meat based is like i just didn't eat anything but meat for a few months mm -hmm. and that way i just eradicated everything else and so when I started, so that way I could scientifically observe when I reintroduce foods, what's actually causing the inflammation. If I didn't do that, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between what is causing my eczema, whether that's the food or whether that's the eczema itself. Mm -hmm. So after a few months on the diet, like the, the good thing about my condition is that after I eat something, it comes up within within a few hours to a day. So other people like Michaela Peterson said, she said when she tried sulfur, like she, she was, she, she felt uh, awful the next day, but sometimes it can take a week to a month to manifest. Like it's quite slow. So the great, the blessing about my condition is that it's instantaneous. I know exactly what inflames me a few hours to a day after eating it. So I could test in that way. Mm -hmm. So having, so if I, if I, didn't eliminate foods and restrict my diet just down to meat, I wouldn't be able to be as scientific as I was and, and, and categorize what foods inflame and what don't. So for three months, the only reason I started introducing fruit back in is because I was getting intense cramps three months in. And that's what 
Paul Saladino explained in his book that he got cramps and the way to fight that was by introducing raw honey again and, you know, sugar in the form of fruit. So Mm -hmm. that's why my diet today is more animal based than carnivore because I have, I have meat plus fruit, but, and I don't have dairy or eggs and butter and cheese. It's just Mm -hmm. really, it's just meat plus fruit. And a lot of actual people online say that's, that's a real ideal way of living like a fruit plus meat diet. Uh, uh, Paul Salino Dino says it's like the optimal, well, he, he, he obviously may be biased, but he says it's the optimal way of living. And, uh, yeah. So, so three months in, yeah, I, I, I eliminated, I eliminated me, uh, everything, but until, un- but meat, and then I could start reintroducing food. So if you're, if you're adopting a carnivore diet, if you're looking for a diet to heal you, I'd say, don't just don't just adopt the whole diet. You got to cater it to suit you. You need to identify what foods you can and cannot. And, and you have to use everything as a guide. For example, Paul Saladino's book, the uh, carnival code, he has this graph where he talks about plant toxins, uh, plant toxicity chart. So for example, legumes, nuts tend to be the most inflammatory as they have the most anti-nutrients. And fruit tends to be the least inflammatory as evolutionary wise. It makes sense. The plant wants you to, to disseminate its seeds to germinate the plant. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, so that's why it makes, it makes sense that it's not going to inflame you. So, but you have to tailor your diet is what I'm, what I'm saying. And I, I think that's, that's an important aspect. Don't just like, even, even not just even in information, like you have to, don't so don't just take any any diet as gospel question everything analyze everything and use it to your advantage uh, and use it to help you as well as information take everything informational informational wise with a grain of salt like the the recommended dietary intake from the world health organization or uh, take every single thing you read and scrutinize it with your own intellect. Don't don't ever just accept things as as gospel just because even as things as as, as amazing as the World Health Organization or IARC or um, you know the, even though they seem like elaborate amazing organizations, question it. Question everything. You know whether you know whether it's COVID, whether it's the news it's important to remain skeptical. I mean, that's the nature of science is to be scientific and question. You can't just remove your ability to question and just blindly follow. You have to question everything to, to be scientific. And that's, that's how I healed. I questioned everything. And that's why I was unafraid to try new things. And, and that's another thing about diet. It's like a lot of people are not willing to try a carnival diet until the doctors say, we can't do anything more for you. Because, you know, I've tried to pix it now because these don't work. So a lot of people are not willing to try. I mean, it's scary, right? Because you could suffer from atherosclerosis. You could get cancer. I mean, I don't want to try these weird diets if it, if it might kill me and if I'm already thriving on the diet that I am now. But are you thriving? You know, a lot of people start saying that the joints start closing up when they're 30. They start feeling older. They can't go out as long and they feel handicapped in some way they don't feel as agile Mm -hmm. is maybe maybe that's a result of your diet so what i'm saying is a lot of people try these carnival diets as a last resort when really a carnival diet is very close to the ancestral way of eating i'd say an ancestral way of eating is meat plus fruit so everything I, i mean i think even the even in the bible it says or even even Ancestrally, there's evidence that proves that vegetables were only eaten as a last resort, as a survival food, in mm-hmm. case there was no meat available, so or fruit available. So yeah, um, long long story short, I mean, just like really scrutinize all the information you can, and don't don't resort to the diet as a last resort. You know, start trying it even if you're healthy. See how you feel. You might even feel even more healthy. Like I was talking to this guy yesterday and he said, I cut out oats and I cut out 
gluten because Dr. Fasano says actually that gluten affects everyone transiently. It actually affects, it permeates, it penetrates the gut and causes leaky gut with everyone, not just those with like celiac disease. So everyone can benefit from an ancestral diet. Uh, you're never too young to start. If it didn't exist a hundred years ago, perhaps we shouldn't be eating it. You know, we looked a lot healthier a hundred years ago when there wasn't in seed oils and all of these processed sugars permeating our diet. That's true. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I love that, man. That's great advice. Um, <clears throat> you know, you got me ready to start the carnivore diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So where, where can folks find you on the internet, Bradley? Yeah. So I'm mostly engaging on YouTube plus Instagram. Okay. So you can find, or you can even find me on TikTok. I've started a new TikTok, but mostly most of my followers are on Instagram. So that's okay. where I've disseminated most of my content. And that's at Bradley Marshall official. Ah, nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll make sure that I uh, drop those uh, links in the description below for everybody so they can uh, hook up with Bradley and consume his content and uh, be enlightened in their uh, dietary travels for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I, I appreciate you uh, spending the time to uh, share with us uh, your story, Bradley. Uh, no doubt you're going to inspire many, many, many people to uh, explore this, this way of eating and heal themselves in the process. And in turn, not only heal themselves, but, you know, you had uh, alluded to your, your mother and your, you know, your parents being affected by this as well. So, uh, mm. you know, you're going to help to, put families in a better position because of your story. Yeah. So I thank you for that. Yeah. I, even like uh, a depiction in America cost 50,000 a year, I believe. Uh, wow. Yeah. So I know it's expensive on a meat based diet, but for me in Australia, it it's expensive. Don't get me wrong. It's around $20,000 a year, <laughs> Australian dollars that is. Mm -hmm. So, so it's still a reduction in the amount you're spending for for, for medicine, for medicines in America and pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd rather heal from the root cause rather than apply something topically that just masks the symptoms, but doesn't address the root issue. Absolutely. You're young, but uh, extremely wise, Bradley. And I <laughs> appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate being here. Thank you so much for your time. Yep. Take care, Bradley. Take care.